Um, I was born and brought up in Saudi Arabia. This, that's where my parents were working. Um, and so I grew up in a desert for the first 13 years of my life. Um, but my parents are from Bombay and I moved back here uh, when I was in eighth grade. Uh, so my earliest influences were definitely my my parents. Both my parents are doctors, um, and that was quite a. Especially my mom is a very strong female figure in the household, and uh, is a surgeon and had three children, and that was. Uh, it was never really a question for us about what women can achieve in in their professional lives because we had already seen that with my mother and all her sisters, she doesn't have any brothers, only sisters, and they all are uh, professionals, somehow medical professionals, most of them. Um, so that was my earliest. And then as I grew a bit more, my elder sister um, was a very big influence. She maintained a very good library at home. So I was I never needed to buy books. I was just uh, <laughs> piling onto her collections, and and that shaped my readings a lot because my sister um, studied public health and she worked with um, she worked against violence um, faced by women, domestic violence against women. And so I started reading at home books about gender, about caste, um, and that also influenced me a lot. Um, and how did I get into water was actually a coincidence. I was in, I studied architecture and when I was in my fourth year of architecture, I went uh, to Mathiran, which is a small hill station about 98 kilometers from Bombay. Um, I went for a trip with my college friends and it was monsoon season. And it was just beautiful. I was really moved by the natural beauty of this place. Uh, I went for a walk early morning with two of my friends around the ridge of the hill. And the visibility was barely two or three feet. We were just walking in clouds. And it was the first time in my life that I was just standing under a waterfall. Um, in this very intimate and almost like private water setting because there was such little visibility that we felt like we were alone. Um, and then the following summer season, I went back to the same place with uh, a cousin of mine that was visiting India. And I was very excited to show her the place because it was so beautiful. And we went there. Of course, I knew it will not be raining. Um, but we kept, everywhere we went to eat food or to have tea at tea stalls, um, people refused to give us water to drink because they said that we don't have enough water. So if you want water, you're gonna have to buy water. And I was, and I still am not, um, I don't support the business of bottled drinking water. So. As, long, uh, as much as I can avoid it, I don't purchase drinking water bottles. And so I told them, well, I don't drink bottled water. Um, so just give me whatever water you are drinking. And they said, but we don't have enough. And then this really struck me because just a few months ago, this place was um, you know, flowing in water. And it really uh, was strange to me that it was just gone and now there's not enough drinking water. Uh, so for my final year in architecture, I started to explore this um, subject or this issue. And I didn't realize that I was opening a can of worms, basically, because then I started to understand the impact of the tourism industry on the water resources of this watershed. Um, the hill of Mathiran creates a watershed for 13 streams that feed actually the water resources which Bombay uses, the city of Bombay uses. Um, and then I started exploring the unequal distribution of water within the small hill, hill station. And, and then 
I, I was not studying water at the time I was studying architecture. So I had to come up with an architectural solution to this problem. And so I was looking at, you know, what are the gaps? I, I, from my, at the time, limited understanding, I realized that there are all these different people who are affected by this issue and who are working on this issue, but they don't seem to talk to each other at all. So everybody has something that they feel misunderstood about or they think that, oh, they blame another stakeholder for. Um, and so I started to see the need for these spaces where all these different stakeholders can interact with each other. So that was how my uh, initial analysis of this issue began. Um, and then I went on to live in Oroville, a place called Oroville, which is in South India um, for almost five years. And there I worked with um, women's groups and also farmer groups. Um, yeah, so that kind of led my analysis. Um, so when I first moved to Oroville, I didn't really have a plan. I just went because I did not want to be in the city. Um, and then I happened to just get enrolled with this NGO. That was not my training at all, but um, I just got involved with them. And they were working with women's groups. Uh, so this is when I, um, I found, started learning about this concept of self-help groups and microfinance. Um, and then on the side at the, with this NGO, I was uh, building an, a community kitchen garden. That was my pet project because we were a community center and it had a very big kitchen. And every month or so we would host about 300 or 400 women and do like a big celebration or a big meet for all the women's groups in the bioregion of Oroville. Um, and so we had a very active kitchen and it obviously produced a lot of kitchen waste and a lot of gray water. And we had a lot of space and I was personally interested in, in landscape design and in gardening and so on. So I started doing this community kitchen garden. And then that involved a lot of the women from the community and they started teaching me things because I thought that I was starting this project uh, for the community. Uh, but through the process, I started realizing that, well, actually they know how to do this really well. And they're just looking at me as a child who does not know anything about plants because I come from the city. So they started teaching me things, you know, oh, this is how you can grow this. This is how you should dig. This is, this plan goes really well with this. So I started really appreciating this kind of knowledge that was with the women, you know, uh, because women in rural areas grow a lot of food for themselves, for their families. Um, and then through this process, I also started understanding the question of caste more because I started noticing which were the women who were, uh, who were comfortable with working outdoors, uh, working with soil, bending, using a certain tool or not. Um, and I started to see the patterns in the profile of those people, you know, and how that work was viewed, which I saw from an environmental perspective. But I started to see that, well, that's not how community members in this region are seeing it. They see this from the perspective of social status. Um, and then one day I, I started to also understand how that is connected with sanitation. Um, and then I started working with an organization that focused on water sanitation, nutrition and agriculture in rural Tamla. Um, so I worked two years with them. And then this project that I was working with, it really brought together these elements of um, the cyclic nature of nutrients, which connects nutrition to sanitation and agriculture and the need for water in all of this. And then, so I was working with a farmer group and they were from a scheduled tribe community uh, living in the Carl Ryan Hills in Tamil Nadu, which is like a scanty rainfall region. And they were having 
uh, very reduced groundwater availability. Um, and then that was leading to them having like seasonal migration. So people could not live there anymore in the summer season and they would get involved in doing um, very underpaid informal labor to sustain their families. Uh, so I started a, a program with them to do water harvesting, rainwater harvesting on their farmland using landscape design because I'm an architect, so that's the skill I had, how I could employ it. Um, and we started to make these water tanks in collaboration with the farmers. Uh, and again, in this project as well, I started re really uh, appreciating that though I uh, had been given formal education in planning architecture and planning, most of my learning was coming from the farmers themselves, you know. Um, and so I would go on the field and then ask, ask them, can you tell me what happens when it rains on your field? And they could tell me step by step how the water moves. So I started doing mapping, but all the information was coming from these people, you know. Um, and that really made me think about, you know, how we understand capacity building, whose capacity are we building? Actually, they're building my capacity, you know, whose knowledge matters and who whose does not, you know. Uh, so I started thinking about all these things, but then of course, through these collaborative efforts, we built a few water tanks in this village. Um, and then I started noticing how that changed or how they used it. And what was the role of women also in that? Because once the tank was built and the buns were uh, prepared around these tanks, uh, it was the women of the families who started to use those areas to grow food for the family. Uh, so this was a, this is a very uh, particular situation. Actually, it's not so particular. It's it's how we what we call in the water sector a food um, food water industrial nexus, where the malnutrition is so deeply connected to the agricultural practice, which is industrial in nature. So we have this region in Tamil Nadu is known for tapioca production, and it is where most of the tapioca of India grows, actually. So the sabudana, that khichdi that people are eating, like a lot of that might be coming from this region. Right? So the farmers are involved in doing contractual industrial farming of tapioca, but their own children suffer malnourishment. Nutritional dwarfism, actually, like 96% of the children that we worked with were anemic. Um, and their growth was suffering because of the lack of nutrition in their, in their diet, you know. Um, and that was also very strange because these are farmers and they're growing food, but that's not what they eat, you know. And then that agricultural practice was also um, promoting or spurring deforestation in their in their um, in their bioregion or like in their forest, and that was affecting the water cycle or the groundwater availability. So there were all these different different links that I started noticing. Um, and then at this point, I I felt like I need to study the subject in a more formal way. Um, so I applied. And I, another thing I started noticing was that because I did not have formal education in the field of water, despite so many years of ground experience um, within policy circles, my opinion did not have much value. Because even if it made sense, people would then ask me what my qualification was and I did not have one. And so it meant nothing, you know? Uh, so I decided, okay, well, if that's the game, then I'll play it. <laughs> so I applied to do a master um, in the Netherlands at an institute called IHE Delft. Um, it is the premier water research institute in the world. It was established by the UNESCO. Um, and I went there to study a water management, a MSc in water management and governance. And I was awarded a scholarship by the Rotary Foundation to do this. 
Uh, so I'm also a Rotary Scholar for Water Sanitation. Uh, and that was definitely one of the biggest milestones for me in my journey because it validated for me because before that I was, you know, for five years doing all this work that nobody really could understand, you know, why I had left the city and I was just living in this hut. And, you know, my parents were a bit like, okay. But my, my father always had faith. He always tells me that um, if you make unusual choices in your professional career, then no one will understand what you're doing. And that's okay as long as you know what you're doing. So the fruit of this will be seen many years later. But while it's going on, don't uh, be dismayed if people don't understand, you know. Uh, so he was he really rooted, rooted for these unconventional decisions. Um, but getting the scholarship, you know, kind of helped everybody be a little bit like, okay. <laughs> Some people think that this makes sense. <laughs> so, so I went to the Netherlands um, in 2020. And at the, I applied at the time, uh, just before the COVID pandemic stuff. So I was visiting my family um, and the lockdown began. I was visiting my family. I was waiting still for the scholarship result to be announced. Um, and I was supposed to be here for 10 days, but the lockdown stopped. And then I was forced to move back to the city. And it really was, it was like coming back to reality, a, a very, very different reality, which was, which is where I'm from. At the end of the day, this is where I'm from, right? Um, and I started to understand what kind of issues this city is facing in terms of water sanitation. So I became very um, deeply involved with the water rights campaign in Bombay, which is the Pani Hak Samiti. Uh, incidentally, my work with them began just as the lockdown was announced. And the situation of water sanitation access in, in Mumbai's informal settlements is has been reported very widely over several years. Um, but during the COVID pandemic, it became exacerbated like several times over um, because the informal water suppliers that cater to these um, settlements. I mean, Mumbai has officially about 40% of the city's residents live in informal settlements and they all have compromised access to water sanitation. And out of those, about 2 million people are outright denied access to water by the municipal corporation. Um, in the sense that they're not allowed to have water access uh, based on various uh, factors that the water policy defined, such as land ownership, uh, the date on which they arrived to the city or their settlement was made. It's called a cutoff date. Um, and so the municipal corporation would put these kind of different um, parameters to decide who is eligible to have water access and who is not eligible. And by such, two million people were pushed out of the system. And so of course, all of these people need water to survive. So they would are dependent on informal water suppliers. But during the pandemic and because of the lockdown, all these businesses shut down overnight. People couldn't get out of the house. And so there was nobody to supply water to these people. And suddenly the municipal corporation had to take on all this extra responsibility, which they were not equipped to do because they were already dealing with a very unprecedented situation. Um, and they had to rethink their sanitation, you know, like the municipal corporation had to work really hard during the pandemic to handle um, such a dense area like Mumbai, you know. Um, I don't know how many of us appreciate how much, how much they worked hard. Uh, but this water situation was really because everybody had to wash hands. We were being told all the time that you must wash your hands. And that's the number one defense against the COVID. But how do you do that if you barely have like a few liters per day, you know? Um, 
So then I got very involved in advocacy work for this issue. Um, and we did a rapid assessment of the state of water sanitation access during the pandemic, uh, which was a survey of 300 households that are denied water access. And we looked at various things like um, what was the status of their income. A lot of people had to take loans just to secure water access. Um, we looked at you know, their education level, what was the demography that was being denied water access in terms of um, their caste, in terms of the religion. Uh, so that started also showing you know, the, kind, the kind of inequities that decide or determine water access for people in the city. Um, and I was the principal writer of the report that came out of this survey. And this report happened to get a lot of media attention. Um, and that media attention spurred a um, renewed conversation between the Municipal Corporation and the Water Rights Committee of, of Bombay. And then that dialogue went on for a year. And last year in May, the Municipal Corporation actually revised its water policy and removed some of these um, barriers that were creating issues for people to have water access. So this was really one of the biggest uh, victories in, in the fight for universal water sanitation access in, in the city. Of course, I don't um, say that all these problems are solved and now everybody has water. It's never, the stories are never so black and white or so simple. Um, but it was a big milestone for the city, you know. Um, yeah, so that has been my journey so far. And then I, I graduated also in May last year. Um, yeah. Um, well, at the moment, I'm based a bit in Amsterdam for, for a few more months. At the moment, I'm doing a consultancy with an organization called the International Water Management Institute. Uh, they're headquartered in Colombo, um, in Sri Lanka. And we are working on a project that uses remote sensing technology to measure agricultural water productivity. Uh, what that means is that we use satellite technology to understand how much productivity for like with this much water for irrigation, how much yield are, are we getting? And it measures this. Um, it can do this over a long temporal scale and a big spatial scale in the sense that it can show you the productivity changes over a long period of time and over vast areas. Um, and then recommendations can be made about how to improve water productivity. Um, my task in this is to develop a gender and social inclusion component, because obviously satellites cannot see people, at least not yet. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, it's actually a very challenging task to take, um, to, to really mix these methods because one is a, it's a, how can I say? To mix a social inclusion angle or to mix a social science method with what we consider today to be a natural science method uh, is often not easy to do because the lenses are very different. The way people look at the world is very different. Um, but of course, it's very important for these conversations to take place, no matter how challenging and difficult they are. So we are trying to do this. Uh, that's my task, really. So that's what I'm doing right now. And next, I don't really know. I've never been a very big planner. I just go with what's coming up ahead of me a little bit at a time and then see where it goes. But yeah.
but I'm also doing some uh, in this process. I also started to make some films. So I've done or I've been a part of producing two documentaries so far. One was about uh, the story of somebody who is a part, a member of Pani Samiti, who got his uh, water connection during the pandemic after waiting for 10 years. Um, so this was a story about his life and how, what was the struggle for water access. And I recently completed with um, a Chennai based filmmaker, another, a second documentary, which is made based on my research for my master thesis. So I did an ethno ethnography with Fisher women from Chennai and their perspectives on wetland conservation. Um, so we did video documentation of our interviews there and then produced a film about this. It's called Fight with Care. So one of the things I'm doing now is also screening the film, taking it to different places, uh, encouraging conversation around the idea of care work and where is the place for that in environmental conservation and really trying to bridge gaps between um, people who work on environment conservation or who come from a conservation mindset and those who are coming from a social justice mindset. So an environment justice and social justice perspective. So that I think, um, yeah, I'm really interested in always being at the intersection of different thoughts and then trying to connect people across that, you know, um, because many times people can get stuck in their silos and then you don't realize that instead of working together towards a goal of environmental preservation, we may be sabotaging each other. And that's, um, that's something we can only fix by having more friends, wider communities, talking to people who you don't necessarily agree with right now, and just trying to understand like, why are they saying this? What do they, what have they seen that makes them think like this, you know? Um, yeah, so that's also what I'm doing now. And I think storytelling is definitely something that I'm interested in taking forward as a way of planning towards water, water conservation. Yeah, I can't say that it's my success. <laughs> it's the success of a campaign because the ca this campaign began in 2007. Um, and if you take the root of it, it might go even before in 2004, because in 2004, there was a widespread demolition of informal settlements in the city of Mumbai. Um, and then that led to a con kind of coming together of people under a housing rights banner, you know? And then through that came the water rights banner. And these different groups, they all work together. But in 2007, there was a push to privatize water resources or water distribution in, in the city of Bombay. And that uh, received a lot of pushback from civil society as well as from the municipal corporation. Um, and then that story really, um, or like that campaign, evolved into being the Pani Hak Samiti. So all of this was happening. I moved to the city in 2007. I wasn't even here, you know? So I can't at all, and none of these things, I think people can say that they are their individual successes. So I just happened to be somebody with the skill to write in English, who just joined this campaign at this time. And I just wrote a report. It took me what, three months? to do that survey and write the report, but the campaign is a good decade long, you know, 12 years long. And so many people have um, dedicated their whole lives to it. It's really amazing when you go to speak with people who live in uh, informal settlements in the city and are so clear in their concepts about their right to dignity, despite living in really unfair, um, disadvantaged conditions, you know, people who are 
facing house demolitions now and again, now and again, you know, but they continue to, or they understand that what their, their struggle is not their personal struggle alone, or what they're doing, the fight for water rights is not a fight for only my water right, that is maintaining the water rights for the entire city, you know? So I would not at all say that that's my success. I just happen to be somebody who could write something. <laughs> and so it's really the success of this campaign. And the same for the water tanks that we did in, um, in Tamil Nadu, you know. It's a coming together, any kind of social change um, is a coming together of the right people at the right time. Not a single person is uh, dispensable in that. You know, um, so if the farmers had not cooperated with me, if they were not uh, also having that idea, if the if my colleagues had not translated for me, because I don't even speak them, so they were really key in explaining what I would have liked to do or what I was bringing money in for, and then explaining to me what the concerns of these people are. You know, it wouldn't have worked. Like not a single person who was on that site on that day could have been replaced which is very different from um, a profit-oriented project or a commercial project, let's say, where if somebody does not do what you want them to do, you can just fire them and get somebody new to do it. You know, that's not how it works in this sector. Everybody is there because they are meant to be there. And so you have to learn to work with different people. And, and that was really big uh, learning for me coming from a city like Bombay, where everything moves really fast. If something is not working out, you just say, okay, you don't want to, you know, you tell a carpenter, like I'm an architect on site, if somebody wouldn't take my directions, I would just replace them, right? But when I was uh, digging up a water tank in some rural area in Tamil Nadu, and then people on site were not taking my directions. I couldn't tell them, okay, I'm just going to get another JCB guy. I couldn't do that. I had to really listen to why this person does not agree. Right? And that changes, I mean, that's, that's a good thing. Because then you really have a, a project that is making sense from many different angles. And that's what you need. You know, planning cannot be done for many people by one person. Like that's really an idea we need to break out of. This concept that there are experts and they know how to do something, I think is really obsolete at this point because we live in a very chaotic world. Things are changing all the time. There's no one person who knows everything. That just doesn't exist. We just need many groups of, we need people who are able to work with other people. That is the expertise required for the day, <laughs> at least in the water sector. So if you're not somebody who can work with other people, that's like not going to work out for you. And one of your questions was like, what is the advice that I would give to, to a younger me, let's say, or like younger people who are joining the sector? I think that would be my advice. Learn to collectivize. Join a collective. Learn to work in a group. Learn to have conversations, difficult conversations, long conversations you know, learn to facilitate. This is really important because the fight is long or the struggle is going to be long. Things are not going to just um, happen in, in the span of a few months, you know. And then you're going to need support, emotional support, moral support. You're going to need friends. Um, and that took me a really long time to learn because I was just sort of doing my own journey, you know, <laughs> went away alone. And I felt like, oh, people don't understand what I want to do. So I'll just do my own thing. But it, it didn't, I did, could not last very long like this. At some point I had to come back to, <laughs> to the place that I'm from. I can't escape that. I cannot escape my identity. And then deal with those difficult issues, deal with people 
um, who I think are doing things I don't understand. Do you know what I mean? That's really important to do. So if you're from a younger age, if you can practice that, then it's a real, a real advantage. I was thinking about that from your question also. Uh, nothing particularly came to mind. Um, but I'm a very big fan of uh, Rumi and his poetry. And there's, there's a quote from him that I really like. Uh, I will share it with you. It says, uh, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. Uh, this, I, I really like this quote because um, one is, I mean, in your interpersonal relationships, that's very relevant. Um, but I feel like it also connects with the way I look at my work in this sense, you know. Um, when I was in college, I'm now 30, I will be 31. I mean, I am 31, I will be 32 this year. Uh, but when I was in college, uh, there was a lot of this notion that, uh, you know, human beings are just destroyers of the environment. You know, like we are the problem. We are the parasite. We shouldn't have children. It, the, the, the lesser children we have, the lower our carbon footprint is going to be or something, you know, this kind of stuff. And it makes us see ourselves. I feel like this narrative is very disempowering because it, it stops us from seeing the power that we have or the potential that we have to participate in the system without destroying it. Um, and I don't think that human beings are the problem. You know, maybe some human beings are the problem, but let's not put everybody under one subset. We need to be able to look at the heterogeneity within that. Different people behave in different ways. There are different philosophies that are still prominent in the world. You know, everybody does not live their lives according to the same economic rationale that we are being told we should follow, right? Or what is being highlighted as rationality. This is also why I brought up the question of what science is, right? What is truth? This is truth. This is, we have like some kind of God, God-like view that when you see something from a satellite, then that's the truth. But even things like maps are not objective at all. You know, the processes of mapping are very subjective. It depends on what you want to look at. It depends on what is the purpose for which you are making such a map. If you make it for the purpose of, I don't know, navigation, it will be different than if you make it for the purpose of conservation. Um, yeah, so I, feel, I like this quote a lot because it also helps me to then like not um, get into this mode of self-hate and just look at, look instead at what are other ways people are operating and emulate that. And again, I'm not always in that state of mind. It's a very difficult sector. You face a lot of uh, difficult questions, choices, situations that you can't change. You feel uh, many times defeated. Like yesterday, I was not able to work at all because I was just so bummed out <laughs> by the um, sheer, what I felt was just the arrogance of my colleagues, you know. And I felt like, what's the point? Maybe I should just go back to living in a hut and just close off and just, you know, make one tank at a time, <laughs> even though I know that's not going anywhere very far. 
Um, but yeah, on a good day, that's what I would do. I'd call my friends. That I think, again, that's where the question of collectives really comes up. Uh, support groups, solidarity groups. Um, yeah, I call someone and I tell them this is what I'm facing. And more often than not, they are facing the same in whatever profession they are in. They don't need to be from the environment field or water field or, you know, they may be graphic artists, but they're facing the same. Um, because overall, I feel like there is a, there's a push on us or there's some kind of pressure on us to be constantly adhering to a, what is considered a norm, some kind of normative, you know. Uh, some kind of idea of productivity and like this is what you need to do to be productive this is what you need to do to be successful this is you know and we don't uh, individual people may not really agree with that but we are forced to make certain um, like to choose that over what we really are feeling you know and for those of us who are more creatively aligned and who are connected with um, our emotions more, we feel that prick more. So I'm also learning to see that I'm not alone in this frustration, you know? So then that helps and then they tell me how are they dealing with it or what is the goal they are looking at that helps them get through the day. And then I try to do the same. Um, the way I think about this question itself has really changed a lot, actually, in the last um, two years, I would say, because I lived for more than four years in Audible, which is, um, it's a kind of intentional community uh, where sustainability, everyday sustainability lifestyle is given a lot of importance. So for over a year or almost a year, I lived in a house that did not have any waste service. What that meant is that no one was coming to take my waste away. So I had to deal with everything that came into the house, I had to deal with it myself. So my very fast, I realized that the answer to this problem is to not bring waste into the house, except for organic waste, which I could easily compost. Um, so I've, I've really done that, like, for some years, uh, lived a very strict, like, maybe even people would say unpleasantly for them, strict <laughs> lifestyle in terms of sustainability, you know, like, not buy a single thing that came packaged in plastic, like, no chips, no, none of that. Um, but in the last couple of years, my view on this has really started to evolve a bit or change a bit. Maybe I'll go back to that. Um, but at this point, I feel like my sustainability practice is more emotional because um, I'm trying to sustain my own drive, which I realize is, is more important for me right now as compared to you know, being militant about a toffee wrapper as I, as I used to be. Um, yeah, so I'm just not like thinking so much about that. But I've imbibed, like a lot of these practices have just become part of me now. Like I generally just don't buy a lot of FMCG products. They're just cut out of my lifestyle. So I already have this problem. But I do live in Netherlands right now and I travel from there to India. So like I can't say with uh, honesty that I'm living a very sustainable lifestyle. <laughs>